Hey, this is Cody Sturge, the pastor at Chill Highway Baptist Church. You're getting ready to watch our weekly Keep Thy Heart video podcast. The Bible says that we're to keep our heart with all diligence. And what we want to do is encourage you with great singing and preaching from the Word of God. In just a moment, you'll hear a message from the Bible, the book of Matthew. And as you tune in every week, each week you'll have a new message as we work our way systematically through God's Word. I'm so thankful that you've tuned in with us today. God bless you. I hope you enjoy the broadcast. for the opportunity to sing and preach and excited about sharing with you this passage of scripture tonight, the message God's put on my heart from the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter number seven. Matthew chapter number seven. Tonight we're gonna look at the life verse of the heathen. It's the life verse of the world and it's misquoted and taken out of context and misapplied and misused to excuse men for sin, I'll just have you know that God does not allow us to excuse sin. And we cannot excuse sin. We can't make excuse for sin. But I'll tell you what we can do. 
Jesus has made it possible that sin can be forgiven. Jesus has made it possible that sin can be overcome. It can't be excused. It can't be ignored. It can't be considered unimportant. But it can be forgiven and washed in the blood of the Lamb. We come to this passage of Scripture and we read together beginning in verse number 1 of the book of Matthew chapter 7. Matthew 7, 1, the Bible says, Judge not that ye be not judged. For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye? But considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, Let me pull out the mote out of thine own eye, and behold, a beam is in thine own eye. Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the mote out of thy brother's eye. Verse 1 of the Bible says, Judge not that you be not judged. That's the title of tonight's message. Judge not that you be not judged. And we're going to see what God wants us to know from his word about this passage of Scripture. Just so you know, you take a passage of Scripture, you take a Bible verse out of its context, you can't rely on your interpretation of it when it's taken out of its context. A context is of utmost importance because we need to understand uh, the surrounding verses and understand the setting and understand what's going on. I've shared this with you before and I'll share it with you a hundred times because what I want you to do is I want you to take and be able to talk to folks the same way. These little things help me. I'm reminded of the guy that said he was going to open the Bible and whatever God said to him in his word, he was going to do it. And he flipped through the page with his eyes closed and put his finger down. And when he looked at where his finger landed, the Bible said that Judas went out and hung himself. He's like, that can't be right. He's going through the Bible, closed his eyes. He said, I'm going to try again. Put his finger down and looked, and it said, go and do thou likewise. And uh, that's a mess. You get yourself in trouble, you know. Uh, this passage of Scripture is very important, and it's very right, and it's something that God's people need. We can't take it out of its context, or we'll never understand what it truly means and what God wants us to understand from his word. It's inerrant. It has no errors. It's infallible. It's going to always last. It's perfect, inspired Word of God. I never look at the Bible and say, what does that really mean? It means what it says. Amen. And we can believe and understand the Bible in its context. When we come to this passage of Scripture, we need to remember this message that Jesus has been preaching through chapters 5, 6, and now into chapter 7, the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus is speaking directly to his disciples, and there's a multitude of people in the background that's listening also to this passage of Scripture. And Jesus is laying the foundation for spiritual, godly ministry in the lives of his disciples and the folks who are willing to hear this message. And consistently and persistently, he's getting to the heart of the issue and the heart of true faith as opposed to the pretense and the show of religion. Now these folks who are listening, including the disciples, they were accustomed to the Jews' religion and the Pharisees and the scribes had portrayed religion in a poor way and they had outside conformity. They, they looked the part, but inside they were rotten to the core. And Jesus uses this passage of scripture to show them their sinfulness and their wickedness. And he gets to the heart of the issue over and over and over again in this passage of Scripture. As this message is continued in that context, Jesus dealing with false religion, dealing with self-righteousness, he says, judge not that ye be not judged. You know, there's lots of interpretations of this verse of Scripture and a lot of them very erroneous. Do you know that someone, there's a Bible commentator, I wouldn't recommend reading his stuff, but there's a Bible commentator that takes this passage of Scripture. He must have had a beef with courts of law. I know courts of law can be awful hard to get along with sometimes, and it can be a depressing type situation. But he must have had a problem with the courts of law because he took this verse of Scripture to mean that God, Jesus, prohibited all courts of law. Nobody can make any judgments about anything. Well, that's not true. He says, well, but the Bible says, judge not that you be not judged. Who's that judge think he is? There are other folks who take this passage of Scripture, and you see this as a very consistent 
application, but in error of this passage of scripture. Look, preacher, the Bible says, judge not that you be not judged. Who do you think you are to tell me that I'm wrong? If it's my opinion, I have no right to say it. But if it's a clear transgression of God's word, then I have every right and I have an obligation as your friend to say, hey, that's wrong. But the Bible says, judge not that you be not judged. Folks, I want you to know something. This is not a prohibition from making righteous judgment. But it is a prohibition from being, from having a judgmental spirit. It is a prohibition from being fault-finding, self-serving, judgmental, critical. Yes, but God has designed our Christian life to be such that we are to make wise decisions and we're to identify right and wrong. You see, in light of this passage of Scripture, and there are no contradictions in God's Word, the Bible does say, judge not that you be not judged, and it's right. But we can also find the Bible, 1 Corinthians 2, 15. You may just make a note of this verse. The Bible says, he that is spiritual judgeth all things. The Bible says in Philippians 1, 9 and 10, and this I pray that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment. What did Paul want you to do? He wants you to abound in judgment. That you may approve things that are excellent. That you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ. What are we to do? We're to make judgments. Right and wrong. The Bible says in John 7, 24, judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgments. So we are commissioned by God, the Lord Jesus, to make righteous judgments. We have the ability to say this is wrong and this is right. I'm gonna meddle for just a minute. I want you to know something. We have absolute, teetotal authority to say that is a boy and that is a girl. We can judge righteously. I'm not that foolish. If you can't tell the difference between a boy and a girl, don't be trying to tell me anything else. I ain't gonna believe you. You ain't right. We are to be, we are to judge. We are to say that's wrong. We are to say this is right. We are to use wise judgment and we are to make judgments and we can make judgments and it's right to make judgments but it's wrong to be judgmental. It's wrong to have a critical spirit. It's wrong to constantly looking at people and finding fault with them and never beholding what's wrong with you. And Jesus is looking at this crowd of people. He says, if you're gonna be effective in my kingdom and effective for my work, you're gonna have to start, stop judging what everybody else is doing with this ungodly, unrighteous spirit. You gotta look at your own self and clean your own self up with God's help and then help your neighbor. We can't be critical, but I'll just tell you something. Bible-believing Christians in so-called fundamental churches can be the most critical human beings that ever walked the face of the earth. And I'll just tell you, you live in a small town setting like this, everybody knows everybody and everybody knows everybody's business. We can be some real critical devils. And I believe God wants us to be reminded of this simple truth. Judge not that ye be not judged. May God help us not to be judgmental, critical, fault-finding. But Lord, may he help us to do the right thing and have the right spirit and understand from his word. The Bible says, judge not that ye be not judged. Now, the Bible continues in verse number two and says, for what with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. Now, here's the warning that Jesus gives us. He says, I want you to understand something, guys. Judge not that ye be not judged. With what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. He says, look, you reap what you sow. Do you know what critical, unkind, ungracious people get in return? 
critical, unkind, ungracious treatment. You fuss and complain about the service at the restaurant. A lot of the trouble originates in the person sitting in your chair, holding your fork, <laughs> drinking your drink. You can't get along with family and friends. Everybody's doing you wrong and doing you dirty. Hey, look, we judge and get judged according to the way that we judge and give judgment. Do you know what critical spirits invoke? Critical spirits. You know what judgmental attitudes produce in the people around them? Judgmental attitudes. Yell at your wife sometimes. See what happens. Most times she's going to yell back. You see, the Bible says, for with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. In my Bible, and in my notes, I've marked this phrase, ye shall be judged. Don't forget that. Ye shall be judged. With what measure you judge, it'll come back on you and come back to you. You know that we're to judge righteously and to make sound decisions. We never should forget that we reap what we sow. You know how we should deal with folks? The way God deals with us. How does God deal with you? Now look, judgment's coming. There is a reckoning day. But God has made it a simple way for us to have peace with him through forgiveness, confession and forgiveness. God is merciful to us. God is gracious to us. He is long-suffering to us. And all God's people are said amen about that, right? Do you know what, how God expects us to act towards others? Gracious, merciful, Forgiving, patient. You see, you reap what you sow. And Jesus looking at this crowd of people, he says, now the way you judge other people is how you're going to get it back. I'm reminded of the simple verse, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Isn't that how it should be? You see, God wants us to have the spirit. It's up to him to make the final judgment, but we're to have... Christ-like spirit in regarding in our regards to dealing with other folks. Verse number three, the Bible says, And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? Here's a picture. Jesus is teaching, and he uses word pictures. He uses illustrations perfectly, of course. But he says, look, what I want you to think about is why is it that you see and notice a small splinter in your neighbor's eye, but you can't see the beam that is through your own eye? Can you see this guy? I see this guy walking around. He's got to carry that thing because if he don't, he'll drop his head in the floor. He's got this fence post stuck out of the side of his head, and he's looking at people who's got a splinter. He's like, man, you need to do something about that splinter. It's not good to have wood in your face. And the whole time, he's got a log sticking out of his. And Jesus says, now why is it that you do that? He says, why is it? He says, why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye? You know, he's got one eye consumed already, but he's looking at down his nose at his other brother. And he's like, man, you got a problem. Man, you got a problem. I want you to know something. It is so much easier to see other people's problems and identify other people's issues than it is to identify our own. We need to be careful. We need to be cautious. We need to behold not other people's sins and faults and shortcomings, but our own. He says, Beholdest thou not? How is it that you beholdest thou the mote that's in your brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that's in thine own? I like these two words. Beholdest, you see it, you're looking at somebody else's fault, but you've not even considered what's going on here. Folks, I want you to know something. It's important that we take time to consider what's going on in our own hearts. It's important that we ask God to help us and to show us one of my favorite passages of Scripture, God's used it over and over to help me in my life, 
is the Psalm 139. The Bible says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. See if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. What did the psalmist say? He said, I'm not looking at my neighbor. I'm not looking at my spouse. I'm not looking at my kids. I'm not looking at the faults I find in my church or my employment or my employer and my employees. I'm not finding fault anywhere but right here. And I say, Lord, if I can't see it, show it to me. We need to get to the place where we consider what's going on in our eyes and in our lives and stop being so critical about everybody else. I like these two words because one, you see, beholdest thou. You see something so small, but you don't consider something so great. I'm reminded of this story. There was a man and his grandson and their donkey. And they're on their way to town to pick up some feed to bring back to the farm. Well, they start off on their trip just the way they were doing. They hadn't thought it through, but the, the grandfather and the son were walking side by side, leading the donkey to town. Well, they came past this group of folks that were leaned up against the fence just outside of the gate, going away from their farm, and so somebody spoke up and said, are you guys a bunch of fools? What are you doing? What are donkeys good for? What are they for? Why in the world... Aren't you riding that donkey? The grandfather being a nice guy and thinking, you know, I hadn't thought about it and, you know, I hate to make everybody mad and aggravate folks, but he said, I know what I'll do. Come on, boy. He grabs his son, grandson, sets him up on the donkey and they take off on down the road. Now, this is great. Some old woman had come down the lane to her house and stopped at the mailbox and and when she saw the sight, she was just beside herself at the indignation and the treachery that was going on at that moment. And what does this world come to? She looks that man in the eye and says, you're not teaching that boy nothing but bad. And that's a young boy with young legs and here you are his grandpa and he's riding on your donkey. And he's making you all, that's a shame. What's this world getting to? <laughs> At that point, Grandpa probably should have slapped her, but he didn't. I'm just kidding. He thought, you know, if she makes a point, come on, buddy. Little boy said, I don't care if I walk, it's fine. He sets the boy off the donkey. Dad, pop, pop, Grandpa hops up on him, and here they go. Now the boy's leading the grandfather. The next person they come to, they said, I can't believe you. Here you are, a grown man, making that kid walk. What are you, a moron? That's the coldest hearted thing I ever seen in my whole life. What are you doing? And the grandpa was like, man, I can't please nobody. What are we gonna do? He says, all right, come on, boy. He's on the donkey, bends over, gets the grandson, sets him in front of him on the donkey. Here they go, on down the road, trying to get to town. Someone coming up the road the other direction looks at him and says, what's this world coming to? We are so abusive to animals. <laughs> this is just horrible. I'm calling the AWPCA. I'm calling somebody because you guys are overburdening and overloading this poor donkey. Well, Grandpa's head basically explodes. He's like, what in the world are we going to do? He says, as far as I can tell, from all that we've learned so far from everybody we've met, buddy, the only thing we can do is carry this donkey. So he comes to finds a tree. He chops down the tree. Somebody's upset about him chopping the tree down. That's beside the point. He chops down the, the tree and makes a little pole and they tie the donkey's feet together and hang him upside down between their shoulders and carry the donkey on into town. Here's what happens. Every group of people along the way, they beheld 
what they saw, but they didn't consider anything beyond what they saw. They saw it and the first thing they wanted to do because that's just how they were, they were judgmental, critical, ill-tempered, bad-spirited people. They wanted to say, hey, he's got a moat in his eye. And you know what we're guilty of doing? You see something and you just let it get all over you because that's just how you are. But you hadn't thought it through one second. And the next thing you know, the next person you see, you tell them how indignant you are about what you just saw. But you don't inform that person you just talked to and you began to gossip to that you don't understand the whole story. You don't see what's happened in the past. You don't understand the circumstance of that story. And I want you to know something. We can be the most judgmental devils you've ever laid your eyes on. And may God help us not to be that way. What are we to do? Are we to stop making wise judgments? No. But you know what we ought to do? We're to consider our own beams. And we're to consider our own spirit. And we're to take consideration. We're to stop and think before we open our mouths and make rash and hasty judgments that are against God and his word. You see, verse number three it says, why beholdest thou the moat that's in your brother's eye, but considers not the beam that's in thine own? Verse number four, or how wilt thou say to thy brother, let me pull out the moat out of thine eye, and behold, a beam is in thine own. So we go here from just saying something about it to wanting to fix it. How many of you know this person? <laughs> I tell you what I would do if I were them. And the first thing I want to say is, you ain't them. Well, if it were me, I'll tell you what I would do. I was sitting in the doctor's office this week, and there was this guy in there. I mean, by the, the hair was standing on the back of my neck. I was just getting ill with him. He criticized everything coming and going in that doctor's office. And I'm thinking, by the time I finish hearing all this, I'm thinking, why in the world are you here? You don't need a doctor. You know everything. We, need, we do need to be careful because it is so easy for us, to, for us to issue remedies about situations that we can't possibly know all the ins and outs about. It's impossible. Don't judge people's motives. When the Bible says judge not that you be not judged, it, it's teach us don't judge motive. Don't judge motive. Judge righteously. But you can't possibly know what's going on in someone's mind. You can't possibly know all the ins and outs and all the intricate details of their story. And we're to have a Christ-like spirit, not a judgmental spirit. He says, look, don't try to pull the splinter out of somebody else's eye and fail to remove the beam that is in your own. The fixer. Oh, let us not be the fixers. If you find yourself in a group of people talking about someone who's not present, say, I'll tell you what I'd do. I'll tell you what I would do. I'd back up about three steps and I'd think one more time before I said something that was judgmental and unkind. Oh my God, help us to judge not that we be not judged. The Bible continues, verse number four. Verse number five, I apologize. The Bible says then, thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the mote out of thy brother's eye. There's an order here. Now, the Bible doesn't prohibit us from helping a brother or a sister. The Bible doesn't prohibit me from correcting my children. Some people want to use this verse of Scripture, judge not that you be not judged, don't make those children mind. That's a lie. It's wrong. 
Don't tell them no. Don't use negative words like that. <laughs> they use negative words like no and mine. Amen. And somebody's going to have to tell them no. It's not theirs. It's mine. <laughs> you know, there's an order. You see, I love you. And I have close friends. And I have relation and relationships and friendships with so many of you. And you know I have an obligation. If I see and I know that something you're doing is wrong, I have an obligation to come to you and say, hey, look, I'm concerned about this. Fred Conley was so good at this, and I'm so thankful for him. For me as a teenager, God used him in a very mighty way in my life. And I never stepped too far out of line, but I was a kid, and I had rebellion in my heart and did things that I shouldn't. And on several different occasions, I remember at the conclusion of Wednesday night youth group, he would say, hey, Cody, I need to see you right after our meeting. Man, I hate it. I hated it, but I also loved it because I remember places where we sat on two or three different occasions. And he said, hey, here's what, I want, here's what I see, and I don't believe you're doing the right thing. I care about you, and I want you to, I think you should make a change. A few times he said those things, and my first reaction was anger. And, you know, who's he think he is? But as I received the correction righteously and correctly, and became teachable and backed up a little bit and thought, you know what? He's right. I heeded the warning of a friend and God used him to help me. My mom did that for me as a kid. Folks do it to me as an adult and I'm thankful. I've had folks say to me on as, the, as they walk out, not here, but at Boiling Springs, I had people walk up to me and say, hey, you preach too long. <laughs> like, Thanks. But you know what? I have an obligation to stop and think about what they had to say because they may have not just been critical. They may have cared enough about me to say something that would help me. What I want to say is this. You have an obligation to help people. And there are folks in this room, I've picked up the phone and said, hey, look, what you're doing is not right. And I just want you to know I'm praying for you. Anything I can do to help you with that, I will and I want to. And you know, you have an opportunity and you should take opportunity to be a blessing and help people. But there's an order. You see, there's an order in order to be able to help folks. Here's the order. The Bible says in verse number five, thou hypocrite. He says, if you're doing it that way, you're a hypocrite. He said, here's the right order. First, cast out the beam out of thine own eye. Then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the moat out of thy brother's eye. First, in my Bible, I've circled the word first, then I've circled the word then. First, then. What's the order? We need to help people. First, cast out the mo, the beam, and then you can see clearly to help other people. You see, it's an urgency, and it shows us the importance of keeping our hearts right with God. Keeping short account of sin. Is this perfection? No. But it's to the place where, you know what? I'm going to do my best to live for Jesus because I want to be the best daddy I can be. I want to live my best for Jesus because I want to be the best husband I can be. I want to live and do my best for Jesus. And when God convicts me of sin, I do what I need to with God's help to cast it aside and forsake it. And seek his forgiveness. Why? Because I want to be the best pastor I can be. First, remove it. Then, God gives you the glorious opportunity to help other people. He gives you the opportunity to help other people. You see, we're to judge not that you be not judged. Oh man, we have a Christ-like spirit not a judgmental spirit, fault finding, shallow. But may God help us to 
have a Christ-like spirit that says, you know what, with God's help, I'm going to keep short account of sin so that with God's help, I can be a blessing to other people. Oh, may we consider what God's teaching us and consider his word and use it to bring glory and honor to our Savior. Let's pray.